my name is Laura LaProy Bernhard from Vector Networks. After the great success of the IT Vision Conference presented by Vector Networks, we decided to go a little bit deeper into some of the overarching topics. Today, we are here at the head offices of MyTax in Montreal. We are going to interview Jesse Vincent Herskovitsi. So tell us about MyTax and, uh, and what you do. Sure, so MyTax is an independent national not-for-profit. Our mandate is to drive innovation through helping organizations uh, connect with academia and universities uh, for their knowledge, talent, uh, and for the state of the art. We've invested in a uh, team of uh, business developers who are across the country, uh, currently 65 uh, and, and scaling up fairly quickly. These are people who understand both realities, both the industrial as well as the uh, academic research, and who go out and look for opportunities to connect the two. So really we are uh, humble, honest uh, matchmakers. Um, we invest heavily in understanding what an organization's needs are, what are their pain points, what are their uh, hopes, what are their challenges. Um, we identify within those which ones are conducive to academic partnerships, uh, and then we'll find the right match, the right uh, researcher who has the kind of skill sets, who has the interest to bridge some of those needs. We'll then help them scope a project that is mutually beneficial. So we're gonna answer and address the organization's needs and deliverables, but we're also gonna help push the state of the art and have novelty components, which is what the researcher is interested in seeing as well. And we connect the two through applied research internships. So we have um, interns who are gonna share their time between the organization and the researcher who's bouncing between the two, really acting as a human bridge. And a lot of the power of the relationship, yes, the company's deliverables and needs are being met, but there's also a relationship that's being formed long-term between the company and the researcher or multiple researcher or labs. Um, and that's really the major value. So it's not a report that, that may or may not get used at the end of a project, but you have these interns who integrate the teams, who integrate the, uh, the companies, the different business units, while they're working on their projects and making sure that everybody's aware of what's going on. And that day-to-day -day transfer, that relationship is really the major power behind a lot of the success that we've had. Do you think it is possible for smaller companies to compete with all the Googles, Facebooks, and Microsofts of the world? And if so, how can they do so? Yeah, very good question. Very appropriate nowadays. Um, I think it is. Um, and. and However, the framework, the paradigm has changed of, of the way things have happened in the last several decades, and they're changing faster and faster. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity for the smaller companies um, in that they are able to be very agile. When you're smaller, you can pivot much faster when you see an opportunity or where you hit a roadblock. I think one of the major paradigm shifts these days is um, the tendencies going away from the big eat small towards the fast eats the slow. And if you look 10 years ago, you could have never predicted um, who would be the major players right now. Um, the players who were around 10 years ago, uh, many of them are not around anymore, the major players, and a lot of the major players today did not exist 10, 15 years ago. So the environment is changing incredibly quick, quickly, and it's changing faster and faster. And the large uh, multinationals, although they have many advantages, um, you know, they have size, they have more money, um, they have m multiple, you know, uh, resources. Um, one of the risks that they have is that to change directions takes much more time for them to do it well. That's one of the, the risks. And the other one is for feedback loops from their market to work their way up to decision makers and then turn into change is slower, generally speaking. So there's an opportunity for, for SMEs, and of course in Canada we have a wealth of SMEs, um, who have their ears on the ground, who have nodes, feelers out, seeing what's going on in the market, and who can again pivot very quickly. If those SMEs partner with large multinationals or large organizations, um, the large organization has a, a, a solution to this need to quickly adjust with the environment that's changing. So I think actually, um, the paradigm shift I'm talking about is not so much in terms of competing with, 
but seeing how they fit into the strategic priorities of the large organizations. And actually, it's not competing, in my opinion, but it's partnering, which is the new game. And who can you partner with where you have areas of mutual affinity, where you may be less competitive, but where you can make up for each other's shortcomings. So where the SME can uh, pivot very quickly, um, that multinational has an opportunity to then pivot with them. Mm -hmm. And where the multinational or the large company has big resources, well, they can kind of help to pull uh, the SMEs along much faster than they could have done by themselves. So I think the name of the game today is partnership and collaboration within areas of mutual interest. And if I was an SME, I would be looking at who are some of the big players uh, who I could partner with. Speaking of interns, how do companies attract the right talent, especially smaller companies who don't have the Google, the Microsoft, the Facebook brands? Yeah, I think that's exactly um, the heart of the beast, um, what's going to make it or break it is, is accessing that talent, especially in, in high competitive fields these days. Um, I think there's many things that smaller companies can do and many areas where they actually can leverage their strengths in attracting talent. One of them, uh, especially talent in, in, in analytics uh, and that kind of domains in AI is, is data. What really interests and drives a data scientist is interesting data and many SMEs have that data depending on what they're doing they have nodes out there they have huge uh, stockpiles of data that they haven't really worked on and that can be incredibly interesting to the right talent to the right researcher um, uh, young researcher so that's one piece is to put on a pedestal the nature of the data and the nature of the projects the type of projects uh, the type of opportunities that those interns would have um, the chance to work on within an SME. And that leads me to the second strength of an SME, which is uh, diversity of tasks. So one of the risks in larger organizations, I mean, one of the strengths is that you can diversify a niche and really uh, dedicate resources to very, very key areas. But the risk to that is that it can get boring um, if you're just looking at a very thin slice. Um, there's nothing better to get a wide breadth of activities than to work for a startup where the CEO is doing everything from fundraising to pitching uh, to stuffing envelopes to putting up the, the posters before they have a cocktail that night. I mean, you get a wide girth of activities and exposure to all of those things. As young talent, you also have the chance to be uh, tackling a whole bunch of these different kind of skill sets, which they will then need later on. Um, so I think those are some of the, the leverage points that SMEs have um, that some of the bigger players don't. Another element is um, the kind of uh, general lifestyle that a lot of young talent is looking for. And a good, stable job with a decent income is no longer enough. Uh, it's got to be kind of fun. It's got to be a little bit trendy. You want to have uh, some you know, beer taps in the cafeteria Friday afternoon. You, you can be sitting around and enjoying it. Um, there's, a, there's a lifestyle piece that, that I think is quite attractive to talent. In fact, we're seeing that in some of the larger traditional industries, um, the kind of talent that was running after these big names, big box store names, um, not retail, but whatever space they're in, um, all of a sudden, they're not so attracted to that. And working like a dog uh, in huge hours and not seeing your family is no longer acceptable. You need some flexibility. You need some nimbleness yeah. there. And I think that's where SMEs can have an edge uh, and should leverage it and, and try to push that, try to promote those areas and grow them, make sure that those are being fostered within, within the company as corporate culture. You also have an opportunity to have the charismatic kind of leaders and mentors and coaching so that an intern who's spending time uh, in an SME, certainly in a startup or a scale-up, is going to be bumping and working with very interesting people that in a larger organization, you'd have to really work your way up before you're sitting around the table you know, on a day-to-day -day basis with the most senior you know, staff. So I think those are a few areas that I think SMEs actually have an edge. Another challenge that small companies might have is their limited budget. How do they go around doing that, especially at a time where technology seems to be growing at the 
fastest rate we've seen? Yeah, so first of all, I mean, there, there are certain core programs in Canada that are there to support SMEs, especially uh, SMEs who want to try to drive their innovation and drive their R&D agendas. So I think it's important to get to know what are the different resources available to them. Um, the good news is in Canada, there's a very strong partnership uh, culture. So often we know each other's programs, we know what's out there. So a my tax business development person um, will be able to, of course, accompany you through structuring a my tax project and then the applied research component, but can also probably introduce you to the local uh, National Research Council um, officer who can come and help to support some of the research that they're doing in-house uh, and some of the uh, infrastructure that they're supporting, which MyTax doesn't do, um, or can help to, to, to bring in certain of the uh, uh, R&D consultants or help you line up uh, cash flow up front for some of the R&D that then you're gonna get after the fact. Um, so there's a whole bunch of resources available um, the question is to get, take the time and understand which ones are, are conducive to your needs and put together a strategy. I think that's one thing that's very important is to take the time to uh, understand what's out there and roadmap a strategy so that we're not just kind of flying blind, um, but you're really kind of uh, maximizing your chance of success and growing that dollar. So that's one obvious uh, piece. And then another one is partnerships. So again, one of the things uh, that historically I think our SMEs could do faster is get closer to the market. So one of the errors I think that, that, that are made is to want to make sure that your product is perfect before you approach your customer. Um, you may have a shock when you do approach the customer and realize that that isn't quite what they wanted or if they already have a solution uh, that's better, faster, cheaper than yours. So the faster you can get with your market, the faster you can build, customize whatever your offer is to that market. Now, one potential is to c collaborate with a potential end user up front. So I'm willing to invest in R&D and to solution exactly what will be useful to you, but I'd like to partner with you up front and know what it is that you'd want and I could send you different generations of prototypes um, so that by the time we have a final product, it's exactly what you want. And in some cases, especially going back to partnering with some of the bigger players, the bigger players might even share the cost with you of some of that R&D. Um, and for example, if they happen to use a MyTax intern, then you can give them visibility over the project through the intern. So now you not only have MyTax sharing the cost with you on the project, but you also have a potential end user sharing the cost. So the leverage is tremendous. The business case is quite strong. So being based out of Montreal, uh, what do you think about the opportunities in the city for smaller businesses? Sure. Uh, Montreal is in an interesting position right now, um, both because of its history and what's going on these days. Um, it obviously has a very rich manufacturing background, um, which has gone through some major changes and has, has shrunk. Uh, but there are some very important pockets that are still alive and well. Uh, aerospace being one of them, of course, uh, but also certain other niches like fashion. Uh, there's a number of other uh, spaces that, that we're still quite strong in. But then on the research side, um, Montreal has become one of the major players in artificial intelligence. Um, and, and, and it's really one of the um, few areas in the world where it's really at the leading edge of things like um, uh, deep learning. Um, and, and artificial neural networks. Uh, and there's an opportunity there. Um, right now, we're in an interesting period where um, the state of the art is transitioning you know, as we speak into the rest of society and into industry. So as we talk about uh, complex ideas like uh, Industry 4.0 and additive manufacturing, 3D printing, um, at the base of all that are certain fundamental technologies, fundamental um, um, research approaches that are all found presently. Montreal has a ton of universities that are incredibly strong uh, in these areas and there's a lot of talent in the area. Um, so for companies who are already here who may have been dabbling or working before in, in traditional manufacturing, um, the potential to transform themselves into next generation manufacturers is there. That said, you know, it, it needs to be done and there's certain fundamental pieces that need to be put in place. But the major foundations, the construct to those pieces, 
are all local. You don't have to be flying to other places or flying people in. So I think that's a really big opportunity for Montreal companies, um, let alone that there's a few really sunrise sectors that are quite strong here. I'm thinking of gaming, um, telecommunications. Um, there's a number of very key players. So for a smaller player to um, integrate their supply chain or their end users, uh, be it so upstream or downstream, um, to tap into that network, that ecosystem, is a huge opportunity. And then to, to tap into the universities as a foundation to pushing them, their technologies to the next level in order to be competitive, um, in order for the productivity to be uh, competitive, it, it is all there. The, the building blocks are there, but you need to do it. You need to have an agenda and a will and a strategy towards that. Another piece that's interesting about Montreal is that um, it's quite a fun city. So in terms of talent attraction, one of the things that MyTax has done recently in the last few years is to put in place programs that bring in, that attract the best from around the world um, in order to have access to more talent. It's nice to have some of the big players around in um, interesting sectors that attract a lot of talent. Um, the downside to that is that it attracts a lot of talent. Uh, so we need to, to build that talent pipeline in order to make sure that we'll stay competitive and that we can keep growing at the rate that we've been growing. So when you bring in international candidates and they come and spend a summer, for example, of a program where we bring in hundreds of students from around the world and place them into Canadian universities for the summer, well, it's easier to attract them when they have a really good time, when their restaurants are really fun, they go to the Mount Royal, they go to the Jazz Festival. Um, that's an edge that Montreal has that we need to leverage. It's a full picture thing. Going back to what current talent wants, it's not enough to have a job. You need to have a lifestyle that's fun and conducive. Well, Montreal has an interesting edge in that domain. So within the last year, my tax has invested in over a hundred million dollars into innovation for businesses and is on track to deliver over 8,000 internships. Why do you think there is a surge in demand for MyTax services? Yeah, good question. I think there's a few reasons. I think one of them is um, it's been very clear and more and more so that there's uh, a need for our organizations, for our businesses to drive more towards knowledge-based knowledge uh, innovation, knowledge-based economy, um, and to transform um, some of our resources more and get better multipliers, um, and also you know, reduce um, or increase rather our productivity rate. Um, but those are all easy to say, but how do you concretely um, start and where do you start? So a big part of what MyTax does is sit down and start from the company's need, from the organization's need in their language, in their reality. Um, we're not forcing them to turn it into um, an academic research uh, deliverable. We want to understand where are they, uh, what are some of the needs that they have, what are some of the challenges, what are some of the threats in their space. Um, and, and then we start from that. We hang on to some of the key pieces that um, are conducive to this kind of partnership and we create a roadmap with them of what their innovation agenda can be, and then we fill it in with the different kind of Canadian research capabilities uh, that have the background that's appropriate to deliver on some of these needs. So a big part of it is accompanying, just listening to what the problem is, um, you know, traditional account management starting from the client, uh, and then translating that into terms that the researchers, and especially the best researchers, some of the strongest ones, who are open and interested to these kinds of collaborations can understand and see the value for them. So you, you, at each step of the way, we're trying to look at what is the reality of the stakeholder? What is the company's need? What is their reality? And then what is the researcher's? What is the researcher need? And we translate each other's needs and we look for an area of mutual interest. And it's the area of mutual interest that MyTax then supports. The project is actually truly win-win. The company's gonna get their deliverable, and the researcher's gonna get access to data, um, they'll be able to, to publish, they'll be able to drive the state of the art, the novelty, uh, and that win-win is what makes it successful and what allows for uh, repeat partnerships. So that's a piece of it, it's the trusted advisor. So everybody wants to be more productive, everybody wants to innovate, but it's not so easy where or how, and we sit down and take the time and invest the resources in order to understand where people are at, 
and then uh, come out with a cohesive strategy for them to start delivering on their needs, be they small scale, uh, dipping their toes in this kind of a collaboration, or large scale, multi-year, multi-million dollars, we support the full gamut. I think that's a big part of the success. Another part of the success is the fact that we are agnostic to the nature of the project. So we don't have our own sweet spot that we're forcing um, the partners to fit into. We support all disciplines, we support um, all sectors, we represent all Canadian universities, um, and, and therefore the project is really around the need of the partners. Um, as long as the project is sound, the methodologies should lead to the, to the deliverables, um, we should be able to support it. So that's another piece of the puzzle, which is um, we support a wide spectrum and we are able to um, bring the resources required pretty much regardless of the reality of the partner. And it's that wide breadth of activities, I think, that is very important to our stakeholders. Uh, it means that we don't waste their time once we've sat down and tried to understand what it is that would be interesting to them. So that's another big part of, of the need. And the third one is that, frankly, I mean, we deliver. Um, we really go above and beyond to make sure that, um, that the programs work. Uh, we're continually trying to optimize them. We also have very close ears to the ground and try to hear, see when there's a gap in the market, where there's an opportunity um, for us to come in, if, if we're the fit for it, to come and, and bridge that gap, uh, always in the innovation kind of a, a framework. So, so that's another major reason why I think uh, we've been just taking off exponentially year over year. This, this classic hockey stick curve in the last 20 years has almost been uh, nonstop. So what does this have to do with universities? Right. Um, so the same way that we're looking for areas of mutual affinities and partnerships between the small and the large that I just, just described, um, there's a similar contrast between academia, um, research world, and industry. And actually what first attracted me to this line of business is the mutual affinity between the two communities. And actually, I think both communities have incredible strengths. So where academia um, can see long-term uh, and really be methodological and attack complex problems with a certain rigor and break them down into variables that can be controlled and therefore try to derive certain um, um, aspects, certain conclusions that may or may not be relevant and then test those. Um, you know, that's one of the major strengths of academia. Industry has major strengths of uh, urgency and uh, timelines and deliverables. Uh, return on investment, the business cases that have to be made. I mean, that's one of industry's major strengths. They both have these strengths, but interestingly enough, um, they both have almost mirror opposite strengths and weaknesses. Um, so that strengths of the business to go very quickly, um, build you know, uh, business cases, measure them, uh, and, and to be measuring constantly the impact and killing early, killing uh, regularly if it's not working, one of the risks there is that if you don't see around the bend or you're not kind of planning longer than your next quarter, you can hit a wall very quickly because you didn't see it coming. Um, so there's strengths and weaknesses in that community. On the academic side, where they are very strong at longer term methodological planning and breaking down variables, um, there is something to be said about urgency and finiteness of resources um, and needing to be able to uh, gate certain deliverables uh, before potentially going further so that you're not going into a track, a never-ending track, and realize later that it was off. Um, so there's an opportunity for these two communities to really make up for each other's blind spots. And actually, in my humble opinion, they, they both uh, tragically need each other, I believe. They make up for each other's uh, strengths and weaknesses really well. However, if you just throw them in together, um, there's a risk of, a, of an explosion because of these very different vested interests and very different realities. So there's a need for that honest broker to help to uh, translate the needs of the two communities, identify those areas of mutual interest, and set up you know, a, a plan that's gonna get them to both of their deliverables. And that is, I think, a big part of the role of my tax, and that is, I think, a big part of the opportunity to partner these two communities. So now you have the academic communities and the industrial communities, and within the industrial communities you can have small working with large, and now you have a web, a network of innovation 
that I think is the name of the game right now. And anybody, any country who isn't harnessing, fostering, growing these webs, I think can be in trouble. There's another element here that's interesting in terms of the applied research component to these partnerships. And I mentioned it earlier. Um, while these interns are plugging away at a specific set of deliverables, it could be technical, I mean, whatever it is that they're working on, by acting as a human bridge between the academic researcher and the, uh, the industrial supervisor, you have a supervisor on both sides, they're bridging these two communities in a day-to-day -day way. Now, you can apply that uh, bare bones, one researcher, one company, to any type of framework you want. So while it could be one and one, it could actually be uh, many companies partnering together through the conduit of university. So perhaps you have a multinational who wants to tap into the agility and the speed and the new approaches of the SME um, who want to work together and or they may be deepening their supply chains or want to explore potential strategic partnerships with other companies. Well, what better way to have those companies connect between each other using the research intern who's going to be plugging away at their area of mutual interest between them, trying to bridge some of those gaps, push the technology up so that it can go on the approved vendors list of the, the multinational. But while they're doing that, they may be sharing their time between all the sites. So all of a sudden you realize that, yes, you're furthering your, your research agenda, their applied research agenda, their R&D, their R&T, whatever they're doing. Um, but while they're doing that, they're actually strengthening the ties. That multinational has a shared point in common with the SME, with this intern who's spending two days a week in each site. So it's actually an incredibly powerful tool, and it's well beyond the scope that many companies traditionally think of working and partnering with academia. MyTax has such a strong reputation to deliver on their mandates and even over-deliver, and we have some stats here that I want to read out. 10% um, of the businesses that you've helped received R&D investments of over $500,000. 11% saw an increase in sales. 30% of them hired at least one of their interns. 34% identified new markets. 74% of them saw increased value for R&D and innovation. These are extremely impressive. What is in store for my tax this year and perhaps in the next five years? Yeah, um, they are impressive stats and, and we work hard to, uh, to deliver on our mandates and to have real value to our stakeholders, both government, industrial and, and academic and that win-win kind of um, um, dynamic is what we're always trying to, to secure, to keep. Um, and actually, one of the stats you read, I'll, I'll give you another level of that stat, which I find particularly profound and links to our mandate and what keeps us going, what fuels us. Um, almost a third of our interns get hired by companies with whom they've worked uh, in their projects. But of that third, half are new positions that did not exist before in the company. And that gets at the core, the DNA of my tax, which is we're trying to make a difference, an impact on Canadian GDP, on Canadian economy. That's really what we're trying to do is move the needle. And it's great if your interns are getting hired into the companies, but it's even more powerful if the companies, after this kind of an interaction with um, expertise in, in, in research and applied research domains, see a value in their critical path and then create a new position in order to make sure that that type of role, that that approach, that mentality is integrated within their strategy. That's incredibly powerful. And if you look at the history of Canada, and we've been fortunate enough to be incredibly resource rich, and that's a wealth, that's not a bad thing, that's a real privilege. But if we could convert those resources, get more multipliers before we sell them, then there's an opportunity there. And that's a reflex, that's a way of thinking and integrating R&D and technology into your critical path, into your roadmap, I think is at the core of transforming and getting a little bit more out of whatever it is that, that, that your offer is. So that's a, a major piece of what MyTex has always done and why we've had the successes and the kind of metrics and project outcomes that, that, that you just read out. Um, so, so historically, we've always focused on that applied research piece, on the novelty piece, uh, and we've invested heavily 
in parallel to that in the relationship piece. So in knowing the different stakeholders, both within academia, universities, who are the researchers who want this kind of collaboration, what are their areas of expertise, what are the hubs of expertise in the world, where are their major tendencies. And then on the flip side, we invest heavily in understanding our clients, the company's needs. So what's going on in your reality? And then we can bridge the two. But we've always focused on the applied research, the novelty needs. So is there potential to expand and support the full spectrum of those needs with academia? So you have a novelty piece, but what happens before? Maybe there's some more preliminary work, groundwork that might happen, which isn't necessarily research or novelty, but important to get that project going. And on the other end, that development piece, that application, the implementation, the final mile is really, really important. In the last federal budget, actually, we were awarded $7 million towards a entrepreneurship commercialization um, brand new program, pilot program. So that's where we're gonna not be supporting a research component, but supporting the commercialization of technologies, companies, startups in Canadian incubators and having them go and cross-pollinate in international incubators, again, getting them closer to their market and tapping into other markets, Canada being a relatively small and population country, it's important to open up the markets. So for the first time, this program is gonna be focusing not on the research component, but on the commercialization component, which is vital for that Canadian R&D uh, and, um, and driving the GDP that we're talking about earlier. So I think next steps of my tax could be to broaden the spectrum and greater leverage those relationships and understandings we have of the industrial pain points to try to address a broader spectrum of those needs. MyTax supports so many disciplines. Um, I'm wondering if there's a commonality or if they're standalone. And just to give a few examples I have here of the disciplines, business, criminology, education, engineering, finance, history, tourism, zoology, law, and music. So can you go into a little bit more detail about how these relate or they don't at all? Yeah. Um, so the beauty of what we offer is a platform that is agnostic to the nature of the need of the partner. So depending on what the need is, we'll go and pluck a different discipline uh, that can come and bridge you know, the solution. In some cases, it may be a standalone. So there may be a company who's just going to do a four-month project. Uh, it's going to be a mechanical engineering, miniaturization project. That's fine. Um, but maybe you want to bring in a materials engineer as well and see, well, what are you using for materials um, and, and what's the stress impact or, or whatever you're looking at. But maybe you also want to project what's the value of that material or that commodity going to be over a longer term. So maybe you have an economic kind of a spin to it or a finance spin to it. And then you create an interesting interdisciplinary team, not just a bunch of different disciplines running around doing stuff, but you create a team that can um, look at a problem from their perspectives, from their lens, and try to bring a, a comprehensive uh, solution that is really the whole and not just one area. Um, and that, that can be very powerful. Um, one of the old dichotomies is, is the discussion of you know, STEM versus arts and humanities. Um, I think nowadays it's very clear that you really need to have many of the skills coming from different disciplines. So somebody who's a coder who is not able to express and communicate what they're doing or pitch an idea or a thought is probably going to have a relatively limited career. Somebody who's a great communicator but doesn't have an understanding of technology or a basic understanding of coding is probably going to be just as limited. Nowadays you really need to have a well-rounded toolkit in order for you to be able to uh, pivot, address, adjust, given that quickly changing reality that we talked about before, the environment is not static. You cannot predict what your dream job is gonna be in 10 years. You can only tool up and try to be as well equipped to face whatever opportunities you have. So in terms of the disciplinarity, it could be single disciplines in some cases, but we can get quite funky and bring in, uh, create teams that come from different disciplines and then you can have a really well-rounded team with as little, as few blind spots as possible. And that's really to the benefit of the partner. So we fund projects that are across the gamut. I mean, you named just a few of the disciplines that, that we've supported. Um, we've supported projects with small startup uh, nano breweries, 
where the cost of operation and the infrastructure as a, a young company starting in a field competing with some very big players in a more and more crowded space can be daunting. That cost can be very difficult. So we have a project where, for example, we help them convert a line of bottle filling for, for this brewery, nano brewery, filling their bottles that were made for, the chain was made for one size bottle, but this company didn't have the space or the capital to buy equipment for two other sizes of bottle. So we retrofitted, mechanical engineering project, retrofitted um, the line in order to be able to do the small, the medium, and the larger bottles, for example. That's a way to be really innovative. That's how Canada can really compete. We don't necessarily have as much capital as certain other players, but if we innovate and retrofit our lines of equipment to match all the needs, you can really have a competitive advantage. That same brewery, we did an energy efficiency project where at different steps of the brewing process, you have profiles, heat profiles you want to do. There's some times where you want to heat your liquids, there's times where you want to cool them. We happen to live in a climate where you can have fairly high highs and low lows. So why don't we run the piping outside and instead of spending you know, a quarter, a third of your energy to cool down your liquid, if it's February and minus 25 out, you can run your line through outside and it's gonna cool itself. You just need to optimize your process. At other times, it's plus 25 out. So maybe you just run it outside in a closed circuit for a little bit and warm it up. So those are ways that companies, very small startup level companies, can have a, a tremendous impact on their cash flow and their productivity. So that's one example at a fairly um, traditional, in a fairly traditional sector. We've also funded uh, startups, young SME companies uh, who are in the high fidelity downloading business um, where you can download your music but in uh, very uh, high resolution so that people with very good sound systems um, beyond mine at home um, can really pick up the granularity, the clarity uh, of the equipment, uh, of, the, of the recording rather. And this small studio, Pro Studio Masters, um, converts from the initial tracks into digital in very high fidelity. There's only one company in Canada who does this. There's three companies in North America who do this. We've been working with them since before they incorporated in order to help them line up their R&D uh, strategy and track and connect them with the right kind of experts. And actually that company has been working with a McGill researcher, uh, Richard King, um, who's very successful in his field and has a number of, uh, of trophies up on the wall. And those are the kind of partnerships that are really, really quite powerful and ways that we can make our companies more innovative. However, we support projects at the other end of the spectrum with large multinationals. Now we have a project with Siena Canada where uh, they were able to cut down the conversion time. So one of the things that Siena does is, is transform uh, signals, telecommunication signals, from uh, electric uh, into photonic to then send it along underwater, uh, under an ocean, for example, and then reconvert it back into electronic or electric. Um, and we have a project where master's candidate cut down the time it took from several days of conversion into, you know, within a day, a few hours. So, you know, wide spectrum of disciplines, wide spectrum of partners and needs, but one offer, one platform. And I think that's what's important to the, uh, the industrial community is to have simple offer to fairly complex problems. Before we wrap things up, do you want to add anything? Sure. Um, you know, we live in a country where there's tremendous uh, opportunity. We have uh, researchers that really punch well above their weight per capita. Uh, we have universities that are spread out throughout the country uh, that are very uh, applied in nature and very open to partnership. Um, and we have a very divergent, uh, broad uh, set of industries across the country with different pockets of major uh, wealth, of major hubs of talent. Um, I think there's an opportunity if we can bridge those correctly uh, for Canada to really excel in, in this next step of, of global uh, competition um, as long as we harness what was one of our fundamental major advantages, which is a culture of collaboration and partnership. And I think that's the name of the game these days. And I think um, Canada has both the pieces, the universities, the state of the art, the IP, uh, and the companies, the SMEs, uh, divergent different fields which they're involved in, um, and that spirit of collaboration and partnership that can put it all together. That's, I think, of enormous value, um, huge uh, competitive advantage that we can harness and propel us uh, in the next step of, uh, of this chapter. 
Yes, Jesse, I actually love how you're addressing small businesses, their advantages, giving them tips, uh, as well as their opportunities, and really emphasizing the importance of partnership. So I really want to thank you for having me today. Um, please let everyone know how they can get in touch with you um, if they need your help. Super, thank you so much for your time. Uh, these are the kind of initiatives I think are very worthwhile and creating bridges for, uh, for industry to connect with this strong know-how that we have. Um, as I mentioned, we have a team across the country, business developers, who will be more than happy to meet with, uh, with different partners, different companies, organizations, and understand where they're at and take them from there. So uh, I suspect you'll be giving the information uh, to, to contact, as well as on our website, by region, um, you can see the different business developers who are more than happy to support and help uh, from wherever the companies are starting from. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.